Good afternoon, my name is Thomas Roussel and I'm a student of medieval history at UCL and this paper is on the subject of clerical literature, specifically hagiography as a cultural weapon against evenism. Um, the arrival of heathen raiders had political and religious significance for the history of the Anglo-Saxons and the clerical writing of the time of Flexus. Vikings targeted monasteries and churches where wealth was to be found. Monks responded through literature, demonizing Scandinavians and glorifying the martyred Christians who fought to defend their nation. The lives of martyred saints such as St. Edmund, who died in 869, and Alphair, also known as St. Alphair here, uh, died in 2012, provided examples of extraordinary courage drawn from their faith, such that might impress even the most skeptical of pagans. I will argue that the militarized martyrs and saints in Anglo-Saxon England are both a shining example to Saxon Christians and also an enticing lure to the pagan Scandinavian settlers uh, that might encourage them to adopt the Catholic faith, as King Canute did. The Second Viking Age began under the reign of Athelred II, also known as Athelred the Unneri, who uh, died in 1016. Although it is during this time that Denmark was Christianized, it is also a time when heathens were arriving on the shores of the long since Christianized land of Anglo Saxon England. It is during Athelred's reign that the Battle of Molden occurred in 991, and within a century of the composition of the poem The Battle of Molden, which strangely depicts a Viking victory over defending Saxons. It is uncertain why the poet uses such a humiliating defeat as a means to glorify the Saxons who were depicted fleeing from the battle. I see this transference of defeat into victory as being a form of propaganda which is typical of Christian uh, hagiography, uh, hagiographical literature. It could be compared to the Battle of Dunkirk in World War II, which was a disastrous defeat for the Allies, but which was portrayed as a victory through pro propaganda. Um, the poet's task may be seen as to use Christian ideology to portray defeat as victory. The victory, in the sense, belongs to the Christian God. J.R.R. R. Tolkien, the author of The Lord of the Rings, argued that the defeat at Malden is depicted as a divine punishment for the East Saxon leader Britnoff's Offermod, meaning pride, which is used as a pejorative since pride is one of the seven deadly sins. But um, is, pride is also a common feature of many Germanic societies, both Christian and pagan. Anglo-Saxon Christianity had not imposed the ideal of passive resistance on their warrior aristocracy. To fight and kill the heathen in the manner of Charlemagne or Alfred the Great was the natural way for a warrior king to demonstrate his allegiance to the church. But this poet is depicting a new kind of warfare that the English may employ by imitating the martyrdom of Christ and differentiating themselves from their heathen enemies. Despite the sin of Orphermod, Britnoff dies at the hands of the heathen, repeating the name of God, fighting for the Catholic cause, and is therefore glorified in his defeat. This literary device is also employed in Anglo-Saxon hagiography where the martyrs and saints, though defeated in the physical sense, remain eternally triumphant through spiritual resolve and determination. What is the reason for wanting to convert these Scandinavians rather than simply to defeat them? Well, the desire for the conversion of the pagans is a recurring aspect of interaction between Saxon and Scandinavian during the Viking period. King Alfred's baptism of the Viking leader Guthrum in the 890s was intended to ensure a mutual understanding of honesty between the two peoples and is described in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. I will attempt to read in Old English. Wis thon here as sukinning thrifnam him va athe sworen of them halyan beer, that he ar nanre theoda nolden, that he hradlicha of his richer forum. That means in 876 the king made peace with the host and they swore him oaths on the sacred ring, which earlier they would not do to any nation that they would quickly leave his kingdom. It was vital in order to prevent ongoing conflict 
in conflict that pacts between Viking and Saxon were kept. It is for this reason that Vikings were required to make oaths on Vamhalian beer, on the Holy Ring, rather than on the Bible, as was customary. This beer may refer to a law ring, similar to the um, Forsa ring from Halsingaland in northern Sweden. That is engraved with the runes which detail uh, regional pagan laws. By converting the Viking leaders, the Saxons could be certain of common values and they, that they might keep their oaths in future. One of the good examples of these martyred saints is King Edmund. According to the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, King Edmund was killed while fighting Vikings in 869. Abba of Fleury wrote his Passio Sancti Edmundi Regis et Martyris in the late 10th century, and Alfred wrote, rewrote the story in Old English soon afterwards at around 990. Both were written during the reign of Athelred the Unready and seem to communicate contemporary fears regarding the heathen invaders. So, using past events to understand contemporary problems. Alfred's story of Edmund's martyrdom is far more elaborate than the very brief entry we find in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle or in Asser's Life of uh, Alfred. So the story of Edmund's martyrdom, uh, a brief summary of it, uh, goes that after losing the battle against the Vikings, Edmund refuses to take his bishop's advice and run away. Instead, he says, Nas me nafra, ye wunalik, that is worth, worth fleamus. Ach is walda swither swelten, yef is forte for minem agenum eared. It was never my custom to take flight, but I would rather die if I must, for my own land. Very heroic. When confronted by the Viking leader Hingwa, Edmund decides he should yeafen laken Christus ye bisningum, imitate Christ's example, who forbade Peter to fight against the Jews. This is the first of several comparisons between the Jews and the Vikings in the text one which by association equates Edmund, equates Edmund with both Jesus and St. Peter. The Vikings torture Edmund, trying to make him denounce Christ. They shoot him with so many javelins that he resembles a hedgehog. Uh, the exact quote is, Besat mit heora skottingum, swilka iglis burster, swa swa sabasianus was. He was beset with their shots, as with a porcupine's bristles, even as St. Sebastian was. And that is a direct reference to the martyrdom of St. Sebastian. Um, this comparison with Sebastian corresponds with an entry in the Old English Martyrology. Um, the translation I have is by Hersfield. Um, Sebastianus tid vas Arthelan martyris, don dear Clitianus, se casere. He was heathen. He het he in mid stralm Scotian, that he was there swa full swa eagle that day or bis burster. The noble martyr St. Sebastian, whom the emperor Diocletian, he was a heathen, ordered to be shot with arrows, that he was full of them as a hedgehog is of bristles. Obvious parallel. When Edmund still refuses to renounce Christ, he is decapitated by the Vikings in a scene which bears more than a passing resemblance to another saint's life, that is the story of Saint Kenelm, an Anglo-Saxon saint, died in 811. As told in the Vita et Miracula Sancti Kenelmi, probably composed between 1045 and 1075, post-Norman uh, invasion then, Kenelm's elder sister, Quanthrif, has ambitions to rule, uh, so orders her brother to be killed by a steward named Ashbert, and though the boy, the Kenelm's only a little boy in the story, he bravely meets death in the manner of Christ and also in the manner of St. Edmund, the martyr saint. The similarity of these three martyr stories brings the authenticity of Alfred's account into question, as does the fact that Edmund's servant head allegedly continues calling out the name of Christ long after decapitation and was found by Saxons in the woods being guarded by a wolf. But this does not mean that certain fragments of reliable information can't be found in these saints' lives. The similarity is evidence that the hagiographies adhere to certain conventions and that these motifs were repeated. They function as a form of religious propaganda uh, used to mobilize the populace against the heathen. 
that is those written during the time of the heathen were anyway. Alfred's account is an excellent example of how Christian martyrdom and historical war against the heathen can be employed as psycho-spiritual weapons, as a call to arms against heathenry and a declaration of fellowship amongst Christians. Here is a shining example of an Englishman who mimics the death of Christ for the benefit of Christianity in England. Such works can only increase the religious fervour and a sense of identification with fellow Christians in opposition to marauding Scandinavians. Edmund had been venerated as a saint during the period of Danish rule in England, and Jane Carroll has suggested the possibility that the very Danes who had killed Edmund may later have venerated him as a martyr saint. That's highly unlikely, but it does illustrate the fact that the Danes or Scandinavians living in the Dane law were worshipping him as a saint. The popularity of the cult of St. Edmund among Scandinavians is supported by Ari Thorgelson's Island Ingham book, written between 1122 and 1133. It describes the killing of Edmund at the hands of Ivar, as Old English Hingwar, the son of Ragnar Lothbrok, and the importance of martyrdom to, of Edmund to Icelanders, like Ari, may have arisen uh, not out of respect for the Christ-like nature of his martyrdom, but because of acknowledgement and identification with the Viking dynasty of the semi-mythical Ragnar or Lothbrok, whom even Ari claimed descent, from whom he claimed descent. Abo is the first source to name Hingwar, most likely the English version of Ivar in Benalsi who died leading a Viking army in East Anglia during the 860s. So unless Ari had access to an unknown source, which we now lost, it is most likely that the Icelandic interpretation of Edmund's martyrdom is derived from Abo or the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. Edmund's uh, memorial coinage was, uh, was minted and circulated in the Dane, Dane Lord territory. So um, we know that uh, the cult of St. Edmund developed in keeping with hagiographical convention and is unlikely to have been seen intended as a means of converting heathens to Christianity. But there is this evidence that the Danish rulers of England accepted Edmund as a saint. And we can see that when we see this memorial coinage bearing the inscription Ske A. Edmund Rex uh, from the early 10th century. It was circulated within the Dane law, and that included Edmund's former kingdom of East Anglia. Heroism is a topic that needs to be addressed on the subject of spiritual propaganda. Heroism is obviously a major aspect of heathen culture. But heroism was a quality admired in Christian society as well. But Christianity has a more flexible definition of heroism to manipulate for hagiographical purposes. The heroic is an alternative within Christian culture rather than an alternative in opposition to it. That's a quote from Phelps Dead on the subject. Alfred reflects this ideal with the inclusion of the lives of two English royal martyrs in his Lives as Saints. Both St Edmund and St Oswaldus die in battle against pagans in a similar manner to Britnoff in the Battle of Malden. This is not to say that the imitation of Christ was considered mandatory for Anglo-Saxon Christians. Rather, it was one potential ideal amongst many alternatives to which they could aspire. Total pacifism would hardly be an adequate form of defence against the heathen. Alfred, Offa, Charlemagne, they are the most obvious examples of the militant Christian warrior against the heathens. Examples that Olaf Tryggvason uh, followed in Scandinavia later on. The two archetypes both fulfill the role of Rex Christianus, the Christian king, whose authority is enhanced by conflict with pagan foreigners, a pagan other, a common enemy amongst Christians. From as far back as the 7th century, the popes had found the themes of St. Peter and warfare for Christ as a vital for adapting Christianity, a normally pacifistic religion, to the cultural requirements of the Germanic barbarians who were a warlike people but in their nature. The theme of passive resistance in the style of St. Peter was a specialised form of conflict that though impractical in battle was employed by hagiographers to transform past defeats into victories. This 
kind of spiritual propaganda, has other types of rhetoric uh, that are employed that have the same function of mobilizing a populace for military action against an enemy. One of these is the apocalypse, a, a myth that's still very popular among Christians today. Um, here's a, an excerpt from the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, which introduces the Viking raid in typically apocalyptic terms. 793 AD, in this year, terrible portents appeared in Northumbria and miserably afflicted the inhabitants. These were exceptional flashes of lightning and fiery dragons were seen flying in the air and soon followed a great famine. And after that, in the same year, the harrying of the heathen wretchedly destroyed God's church in Lindisfarne through rapine and slaughter. Uh, this style of war, spiritual warfare against the pagans that is prevalent in Anglo-Saxon hagiographical literature is in keeping with the apocalyptic rhetoric in numerous Anglo-Saxon texts, including Wolfgang's Sermo Lupi ad Anglos, Guando Dani Maxima Persecute Sunt Eos, or the Sermon of the Wolf to the English for short, in which the fate of the English at the hands of the heathen Vikings is said to be a manifestation of divine punishment for the impiety of the English and symptomatic of the beginning of the apocalypse. Another example of heathen raids depicted as divine punishment can be found in Alcuin's letter from the court of Charlemagne to Alfred, king of Northumbria. Alcuin wrote, Consider carefully, brothers, and examine diligently, lest perchance this unaccustomed and unheard of evil was merited by some unheard of evil practice. Blame yourselves for what the heathen are doing to you. If the arrival of the heathen is, is the product of unchristian behavior, the same reasoning holds that the remedy to heathen raids is a more Christian society, one with more Christ-like saints canonized through martyrdom at the hands of their heathen enemies. Uh, there's much more apocaly apocalyptic rhetoric to get through here. The arrival of a common enemy on English so soil may have been a benefit to Anglo-Saxon kings, so though it's unlikely they would have thought that at the time, the perceived otherness of the Danes due to their paganism could be a means of ut uniting and militarizing different regions and therefore consolidating power. Homilists such as Wolfstan and the anonymous author of one of the sermons of the, in the Blickling Homily collection use fear of the impending apocalypse to create a sense of urgency in the battle uh, against the heathens. Here's a quote from the Sermon of the Wolf. Beloved men, Recognize what the truth is. This world is in haste and nearing the end, and therefore the longer it is, the worse it will get in the world, and it needs must thus become very much worse as a result of the people's sins prior to the advent of Antichrist. And then, indeed, it will be terrible and cruel throughout the world. Wollstan had been Bishop of London, Worcester and York, where a lot of Vikings used to hang about, and he undoubtedly had first-hand experience of Danish settlers. And his Sermon of the Wolf was composed between 1010 and 1016 under the reign of Athelred II and puts the blame for the arrival of the heathen on their English victims. Um, another quote from Wolfstan, this time from his Secundum Markham. The time of the Antichrist is very close, and so the longer the world goes on, the worse it is. People are treacherous, and the world is the worse for it. And this damages us all. And henceforth, indeed, things are going to become seriously heavy for the righteous, the needy, and the innocent. The sermon suggests that the pagans arrived because the Anglo-Saxons have failed to be pious Christians, and that they will only be free of the heathen through a program of militarization and Christian reform, such as that implemented by Alfred over a century earlier. The impending doom of apocalypse puts a time limit on salvation. This encourages desperate attempts to prove one's Christian virtue before the second coming. It's the same kind of rhetoric. In, you know, you get people to go out and take the crusades against the Muslims later on after they've finished with the heathens. There's an image of hell mouth. Uh, this is the imagery of Catholic apocalypse. Very striking. Here's another saint, similar to Edmund, uh, in his martyrdom, Althair, mentioned previously. The cult of Althair was based on a similar type of martyrdom, martyrdom to that of Edmund, but was contemporary with the Second Viking Age. Here's 
had Alfred been alive when Althea was martyred in 1012, he may have written the life of Althea, which reflected the biblical themes with which his other works were concerned. The Lord Chronicle portrays Bishop Althea's brave and noble sacrifice to the name of Christianity, preferring to be martyred than to have a ransom paid on his behalf to the Vikings. The Parker Chronicle records how King Canute later became associated with the cult of St. Althea. It was a wise decision on his part. Um, it describes how in 1023, Canute had the bones of the saint moved from St. Paul's in London to Christ Church, Canterbury. This act may have helped to associate Canute with the cult of Althea and disassociate him from his Scandinavian kinsmen who were responsible for killing Althea. Wolfstan helped guide King Canute toward the ideal of uh, an English Christian king. He learned the value of public displays of piety and patronage as a means to legitimise his claim to the throne of Christian England. Despite his recent heathen heritage and the fact that the official eulogies back in um, Scandinavia legitimise his rule for approval of the Viking god of war, Odin. Not very Christian. Um, according to a 13th century manuscript of Miracula Sancti Sweduni, Canute not only moved the relics of Anglo-Saxon saints such as St. Swithin within England, but also sent a relic of St. Swithin to Denmark. Haki Antonsen has argued that Canute's intentions behind the relocation of saints' relics in England also led him to relocate the bones of saints in Scandinavia, including those of his former enemy, or Olaf Haraldsson. This was a means of neutralising hostile sentiment toward his rule. His policy regarding saints across his vast kingdom seems to have been to draw relics to establish centres of power. This is likely to have contributed to the secure establishment of Christianity in Norway and Denmark in the 11th century. Canute not only adopted the cult of the indigenous saints of England, but also the conventions of hagiography regarding the ideals of English kingship. His most famous legend, an act of flamboyant humility, in which he demonstrates his lack of power over the ocean, corresponds to the ideal of a pious king, pious leadership that had been maintained in England for centuries. So, Alfred's Lives of Saints were composed for devotional private reading, but they could be read to an audience. The messages of the hagiographies were intended for, you know, a pri a, a primarily for a literate elite, uh, cl clerical officials and such. But it wouldn't be much good if those were the only people who heard them, and we know that they did filter down. Uh, it can be assumed that they filtered to these lower sections of society. In, in, and that includes abroad as well. In the Icelandic source, cited as the Saga of St. Edmund in Ari Thorvaldsson's Islandinga book, it is most likely Abbo that they, uh, they are talking about there. By the 12th century, the cult and its story had penetrated Scandinavian clerical literature. This would have been unlikely to occur if such texts were exclusive to a small section of the Anglo Saxon ar aristocracy or clerical officials and such. So the stories of many martyred saints were constructed posthumously and quickly gained momentum as their cults were adopted by kings and perpetuated through patronization. Athelred the Unready paid out huge sums of money to invading Danes, including £36,000 in 1007 AD, and he still couldn't protect England from the invaders, so that was a waste of time. The transition from Athelred to Canute was made less problematic by the fact that Athelred was an unpopular king. He was a loser. He couldn't do any. He couldn't get rid of the Vikings. He wasn't ready for them. Um, but Canute successfully managed to manufacture an image of himself as a Christian king in the English tradition, despite his pagan heritage. And he was much better at getting rid of Vikings, being one himself. M.K. Lawson suggests that Wolfstan's writings, such as the Institutes of Polity, contain allusions to current affairs such as the transition from Athelred to Knut. The, here we see the modern political issues being translated through these clerical sources. <coughs> to conclude, the canonization of saints was a weapon in the war against the heathen. 
Later Anglo-Saxon hagiographical writing reflects this, um, and it reflects European cultural norms so that parallels may be drawn between the Anglo-Saxon saints such as Edmund and much earlier ones such as Lawrence. The stability of Anglo-Saxon Christianity and therefore of England itself was threatened by the advent of the Second Viking Age. To the authors of clerical literature, the heathen represented the divine hand of God and became a social device with which the church could manufacture a new understanding of Christianity. And much of this was formalized under the reign of King Canute, whose own Viking heritage drove him towards a more fervent Christianity. Canute restored and revived the cult of many Anglo-Saxon saints which survived long after Norman conquest. Under his reign, the Scandinavians living in the Dane law became assimilated and Anglo-Saxon saints were adopted by Danes in England and abroad. <laughs>